In 1917, Lord Allenby conquered the Holy Land, and the Jews were promised a national home in Palestine by the Earl of Balfour, a policy endorsed by Woodrow Wilson and by the League of Nations, which made Palestine a British mandate. At the turn of the 20th century, this sparsely populated land, then called the province of southern Syria or Palestine, had been ruled by the Turkish Ottoman Empire for four centuries. At that time, Great Britain was ruling over almost one third of the world. Its dominion stretched across the earth to the extent that it was said that the sun never set upon the British Empire. For at least 200 years, the Evangelical Church in Britain had been sympathetic to the restoration of the Jews to their ancient homeland in what was then known as Palestine. There was only one real form of Christianity which was prevalent in political circles, and that was the form of Christianity which took seriously God's word and took seriously the injunction of the Jewish people to return to the land. In 1917, the Allied armies swept across the Sinai Peninsula into the Negev to oust the Turks from Palestine. On October the 31st, the Anzac light horse captured Beersheba, which opened the way for the Allies to take Jerusalem. On that very same day, the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, and Foreign Secretary, Arthur Balfour, were in a cabinet meeting in London to formulate government policy for a Jewish national home in Palestine. The resulting Balfour Declaration was published two days later. It was providential, I believe it was God's providence in interaction, his sovereignty, that Balfour and Lloyd George were in those senior positions right at that crucial time. As I researched the subject, I realized the Balfour Declaration was written by only 10 men, the 10 men of the War Cabinet. And as I took a closer look at the lives of these 10 men, I realized that seven out of the 10 were from evangelical Christian backgrounds. After a further six weeks of fighting, Jerusalem, the ancient Jewish capital, fell into British hands. I was always interested what was going on. I was only six years old when I went downstairs and I saw people standing on either side of Yaffa Street. And I asked them, why are you standing here? And they said, Lord Allenby is coming down and we want to welcome him. And before long, I could see the horse coming down Jaffa, Jaffa Street. And everybody was so wild with excitement. We thought that Messiah was coming. This was our thought. Anyhow, he rode all the way and he went as far as the, the, the Jaffa gate is and dismounted and walked into the old city. The entrance of General Allenby and the forces from the Egyptian Expeditionary Force into Jerusalem on the 11th of December 1917 was in effect the culmination of the Restorationist dream, that dream which had been relevant within British Christian circles especially, but also in other countries for several hundred years, the dream of the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. And so the coming of General Allenby here in 1917 really was the fulfillment uh, of much of that expectation from the previous few hundred years. 
In 1918, Chaim Weizmann, the leader of the Zionist organization, who would one day become the first president of Israel, came to Palestine to further the Zionist cause. He arrived in Jerusalem to a tumultuous welcome from the Jewish population. However, he found that the British military administration was less than enthusiastic. The British administration that was here in place by then wasn't sympathetic at all. So just imagine the Zionist organization coming in saying, well, we've been given this promise by the government that this will be a Jewish homeland. And they're sort of thinking, never heard that. Or if they had heard it, they didn't want to acknowledge it. Right from the start, it was obvious, right to, uh, both to the Arabs and the Jews, that the British administration was anti-Zionist and strongly against the, the return of the Jews. And from that time on, there wasn't uh, either a military governor or later on, apart from Sir Herbert Samuel, there wasn't even a civil governor who wasn't tainted with anti-Semitism. In April 1920, Britain and France met with the League of Nations in San Remo, Italy, to obtain a mandate to rule over the former Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem, the governor's chief of staff enlisted the help of a well-known Arab agitator in an attempt to sabotage the outcome of the San Remo Conference. Colonel Walters Taylor met with uh, uh, El Husseini, El uh, Haj El Amin, and he told him, and this is a quote, that he had a great opportunity to show the world that Zionism uh, was unpopular, not only with uh, the Palestine administration, but also in Whitehall. That uh, wasn't true, actually. And uh, he said that if disturbances of sufficient violence took place over Easter, uh, then both General Bowles and General Allenby would advocate the abandonment of the Jewish national home. With the Jewish police disarmed on the orders of the administration and a cordon around the old city to prevent outside help, the riots started with cries of, we shall drink the blood of the Jews. Don't be afraid, the government is with us. The Jewish quarter was ransacked and several people killed. However, Zaev Jabotinsky, who had fought with distinction in the British army during World War I, managed to break through the police cordon to quell the bloodshed. Jabotinsky uh, and his uh, self-defense boys were locked up in jail. Abbot Jabotinsky was sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. And the only reason why he didn't serve that term was because there was a, an uproar uh, which was absolutely unprecedented. Hajamin was given a five-year sentence for his overt role in the pogrom, but he escaped in mysterious circumstances a precedent had been set that would haunt the rest of British rule over Palestine. The San Remo Conference of April 1920 had awarded Britain the mandate to govern Palestine. This gave the Balfour Declaration official status. The Balfour Declaration was implemented by its incorporation virtually word for word in the mandate. And the mandate is a document, uh, you might call it an international agreement between uh, the League of Nations on the one part and Britain on the other, in which uh, Britain undertook towards the League of Nations that it would administer, administer Palestine in accordance with the terms of the mandate. However, even before the mandate was formally implemented, the colonial secretary, Winston Churchill, divided Palestine down the Jordan River, creating a separate Arab homeland called Transjordan. The Jews were only allowed to settle in 22% of Palestine west of the Jordan River. In 1929, the Holy Land was once again rocked with violence and the worst pogrom since the time of the Crusades. Hajj Amin, 
appointed the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem by the British, was at the center of the trouble. Worst hit was the oldest Jewish community in the world, in Hebron. All the um, uh, leaders of the community, the, the, my father, the Ashkenazi Rav, and uh, Sfaradi Rav, and uh, my brother, all went to the governor to ask for protection. And when uh, he told them, go back and to your people and see that everybody stays home. And if they stay home, nothing will happen to them. Once again, as in 1920, the cry went up, the government is with us, killed the Jews. And the government simply did nothing. You didn't see on, on the whole time, not a, a policeman, not a, a responsible person, nobody, nobody. The, the crowd was, incited crowd, was free to do whatever they, they planned. And one of the first houses that they attacked was my brother's house. And the result was very tragic. And uh, they killed my brother, they killed his wife and his son, and only a son a year old was badly wounded and uh, came out alive. They attacked all the Jewish homes with a cruelty unbelievable. And, uh, after about two hours, uh, appeared the policemen on, ho on horses, and with a one shot in the air, the, the crowd dispersed and ran away. The riots of August 1929 left 139 Jews dead and 339 injured. Of the 139 who lost their lives across the country, half of them lived in Hebron. The British authorities responded by ethnically cleansing Hebron of its Jewish population. My father died a few years later, heartbroken and ill, uh, mourning his, uh, his community destruction and uh, loss of his uh, family. The highest term of imprisonment for the Hebron riots and murders was 18 months. There was one case of uh, a fella who had killed the two young sons of a woman named uh, uh, Fruma Charcoal by dashing their brains out. Uh, he known the family for years, and when the mother pleaded with him to save their lives, he simply laughed at her. And they were battered to death, and with a surviving son, she appeared in court against him, and as well as the invalided father, and they described the attack together with other white eyewitnesses. The court freed the Arab and uh, claimed that there was insufficient evidence. Two royal commissions followed the riots of 1929. As a result, the then colonial secretary, Lord Parsfield, issued a white paper in 1930 severely restricting Jewish immigration into Palestine and contravening one of the main obligations of the mandate given by the League of Nations. The obligations are, are quite important. They were, first of all, uh, to uh, assist in the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Uh, they were to encourage and facilitate Jewish immigration. They were required to promote close settlement as opposed to extensive cultivation of the land. But because of fear, Britain enacted legislation which resulted in appeasing Arab opposition. Uh, to Jewish settlement and prevented the transfer of any lands 
uh, to, Jewish, to Jewish inhabitants other than lands in which Jews had already settled. A study of the minutes of the Permanent Mandates Commission ever since 1923 um, shows quite clearly that they were most unhappy with the way that Britain was handling uh, the mandate. <laughs> In 1936, Hajamin al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, instigated an Arab armed revolt across Palestine which continued with only brief respites until 1939. Meanwhile, in Europe, anti-Semitism was intensifying. By 1938, Adolf Hitler had been ruling over Germany for five years. The Jews had been stripped of their civil rights and declared as a subhuman race. Their property was being targeted, their books burnt. With persecution of the Jews at epidemic proportions across Central Europe, there were hundreds of thousands of desperate and homeless Jews. Then they were still free to leave, but they had nowhere to go. President Roosevelt of the United States called an international conference in July 1938 at Evian in France in order to seek for a solution to the escalating Jewish refugee problem. Present were representatives of 32 nations, including Britain. Almost all of them closed their doors. Britain took 10,000 Jewish children in an operation known as the Kinder Transport. What Britain did in this case was very good. The Jewish communities tried to persuade the Americans in Washington to do the same, and Washington wouldn't. No other country in the world, as you know, after Evian, admitted that many. However, with the likelihood of war with Germany and the possibility of the Arabs siding with Hitler, the British government decided to curb Jewish immigration into Palestine. The MacDonald White Paper of 1939 was a repudiation of the Balfour Declaration. The Permanent Mandates Commission of the League of Nations accused Britain of a flagrant breach of the mandate and called attention to her um, virtual suspension of Jewish immigration. Uh, instead of Palestine being basically the, estab the establishment of a Jewish home, by 1939 the Arab interest had become paramount and the Jewish interest was very residual in, a, in effect. So it's a complete retreat from the mandate. It was a appeasement, a political appeasement, and paid the blood of the Jews. The White Paper of 1939 became the policy of the British government as the Nazi Holocaust descended upon Europe. For the hundreds of thousands of Jews that were trying to escape the inferno they knew was descending upon them, there was nothing to lose but to try to reach the historic Jewish homeland in what was then known as Palestine in any way possible. The Jewish agency in Palestine, together with the underground organizations, had little option but to bring the Jews home in a clandestine operation. With the outbreak of war, the Jewish battle for survival off the shores of their promised land became more desperate. The British government wanted to send a clear signal to the Jews of Europe. The gates of Palestine were closed to them. I believe uh, that if the gates were open as they should be, as uh, the first, uh, as the declaration of Balfour, if it would have really, had really been uh, the 
uh, National House for Jews, very many Jews would have uh, survived and they were uh, live today uh, with us here in Israel or any other place. However, instead of returning the Jews to a certain death in Europe, Britain interned them. The year before the war began, the British had built a detention camp on the coast at Adlit. For the final 10 years of the mandate, it served as a main detention camp for Jews on the soil of Eretz Israel. The less fortunate were deported and imprisoned elsewhere. One among the many thousands was Annie Groner. Because we are Jew and we cannot be stay in Israel, so they sent us to the prison. My life, five years of my life, I was in prison in Mauritius because I was a Jew. It's a dark, dark stamp on the British authority. Even the Arabs would won't go mad if few ships will arrive at night and unknown people. There was nothing illegal about Jewish immigration. The whole purpose of the mandate was to provide a national home for the Jews. You know, I can't understand after the so, so many troubles why they are do why they are doing it? For what? For what we we must pay such a you know, they stole me five years of my life. Five years of I was twenty years old. It's a paradox. When you see every nation, every tribe has a right except the Jews. Why? Why? Why every tribe in Africa has land and land and land? We cannot have it. And we know what we want. We want this land which our forefathers lived. This is the land which the Bible was lived and written. And there's no we cannot take any other place, and besides, nobody offering us anything. I don't think that when you go back to this uh, period that many British will be proud of, of this uh, stupid and revolting policy. In the middle of 1942, news started coming out of Nazi-occupied Europe of Hitler's mass murder of the Jews. By the end of the year, it was common knowledge in Britain, yet the government did nothing about it. In March 1943, Archbishop William Temple, who had been advocating the opening of the shores of Britain and Palestine to Jewish refugees, addressed the House of Lords. We at this moment have upon us a tremendous responsibility. We stand at the bar of history, of humanity, and of God. The tragedy is when the white paper was published in 39, only 15,000 Jews were allowed to enter a per year, 75,000 in five years. Even this stupid number when you need millions of certificates, when Hitler was slaughtering millions and millions. At the end of the war, 36,000 certificates will remain without use. They could have saved 36,000 Jews. It's unbelievable. My whole family is going to gas. We came here, we, uh, the time we were there, we didn't know. Only we came here to Israel, they tell us that nobody is alive.
By the end of the war, it was much worse than anyone had imagined. At least six million Jews had been slaughtered by the Nazis and their collaborators. Those who had survived the death camps were in a desperate state. Many of the Jews were the sole survivors in their families, and they had nowhere to go. You see, no country wants to accept them. Not America, not England, not any place. So the option was only in Palestine. But officially, the gates of what was supposed to have been the Jewish national home in Palestine were still closed to the Jews, as they had been throughout the war. The British attitude became more and more negative. They were coming on ships full of, of refugees, miserable refugees, after the war, after the Holocaust. And they were intercepted here by the British, either sent to the athlete, then later on when the athlete was full up, they were sent to Cyprus. And then when even Cyprus was full up, they would send them back to Europe back to Germany, like the story of the Exodus. I realize what I'm carrying. I'm carrying the, the last children of Israel who were alive in Europe. Whatever was left of, of my nation after six million uh, were killed. And the responsibility was enormous. I realized what I'm carrying. And on the Exodus, were like a small town, 4,500 people, with all the things. You have elderly, children, sick, everything you wanted. And uh, this was, to me, the lighthouse of my work. After a six-day voyage from southern France, the Exodus was apprehended in international waters by a flotilla of six British warships in the southeastern Mediterranean. Yossi Harel was intending to beach the ship in Tel Aviv. However, two destroyers rammed the Exodus from either side in order to try and steer her away from the coast. In an attempt to gain control of the ship, Royal Marine Commandos from the two destroyers on either side jumped aboard the Exodus. Some of them we took back to the sea, some we took prisoners. They opened fire, they killed three people and we had over 100 wounded. We didn't have any, any, any arms. Our arms were the children and women. After gaining control of the wheelhouse, the Marines steered the exodus northwards towards Haifa. The quality and of warship attacking a very old ship which, which carried 4,500 people was beyond my understanding because the, the tragedy could have happened. They could have sunk the exodus. Then it would be a catastrophe. On the 18th of July, 1947, the battle-scarred exodus with its weary cargo of Holocaust survivors docked in Haifa Harbor. Out of Palestine comes the camera story of the Exodus, the Jewish immigrant ship that highlights new violence in the Holy Land. The refugees were taken off the Exodus and transferred to three prison ships, 1,500 people on each ship. Even the wounded were transferred. All except those who were critically injured and the dead. Crew members of the Exodus were deported with them. When they came and then were beaten by British soldiers, they start crying. It was unbelievable. 1,500 people crying. It was so devastating to them to see they are being expelled from Haifa, from Israel. And they just sat down. They cried. They cried. It was uh, something which we will carry all our life. 
Two United Nations representatives were on the wharf to see the misery of those survivors of the Holocaust. What they witnessed would help change their destiny. The British Foreign Secretary, Ernest Bevan, decided to make an example of the refugees and ordered that they be sent back to Europe. More than 4,000 Jews are once more back in the hated and dreaded country from which many of them began their long, desperate trip to Palestine. They finished up where they had started, imprisoned in detention camps in Germany. Many people connected. The ship, the state really was born when the Exodus came to Haifa and was the center of the fight to bring any Jew who wanted to come, to come to Israel. And the, the reaction of the world uh, opinion. They, they saw the injustice which is done to people who survived Auschwitz. They don't have a place in this world. The only place which we believed we can have was Palestine. The next thing that they did, the British, was to prevent us from being ready to this war that was expected. Britain had already declared that it was withdrawing uh, and purely as a matter of policy, uh, Britain had decided against the establishment of the State of Israel, although it didn't vote against it, it certainly didn't vote for it. Um, and in its withdrawal procedures, it in many cases handed over lock, stock and barrel um, arms uh, and certainly military emplacements, encampments to, to the Arabs. Egypt got all its armament and its training and its tanks and its airplanes from, from England. If you take Jordan, even the chief of staff of the Jordanian army was a British officer. Pa Glab, they called him Glab Pasha, but it's a, a British officer. And not only him, he had with his staff kind of quite a number of other British officers. A month before the British withdrew, one of the worst atrocities of the mandate took place. On the morning of the 13th of April, 1948, a convoy to the Hadassah Hospital on Mount Scopus was stopped and attacked by a group of armed Arabs. Dov Chaikin, who had just been discharged from the British Army, saw what happened. Where I'm now standing, <clears throat> just on the other side of the road, where that car just came up, that's where the uh, Hadassah convoy was blocked by a mine by the side of the road. This is about the spot where the massacre took place. The twice-weekly convoy was carrying patients, medical personnel and other hospital workers. To the best of my recollection, just over here, there was a, a small British army post. They did nothing. And I heard afterwards that a certain Brigadier Churchill wanted to come to the rescue of the convoy and the higher up authorities forbade him to do so. And the uh, Palmach was going to come to the aid of the convoy and the British authorities said, if you do, you'll be fired upon by the, our soldiers. In all, 78 people were ruthlessly murdered. Many of the bodies mutilated. When the British Army eventually did intervene, there was no one left to rescue, though a handful of people had managed to escape. No one in the British Army was ever brought to account for the appalling death toll which they could have largely prevented. There was a, a man by the name of James McDonald, the first American ambassador to Israel, who said that when he was in the presence of Bevan, he would hear Bevan ranting against the Jews in a very similar way that Hitler would rant against the Jews. And in some cases, McDonald thought that Bevan was just as bad in his thinking, a very uh, frightening thought. 
They knew exactly what the Arabs were telling their people, that they come in Israel not in order to, for, for, for a parade, but in order to exterminate the Jewish existence in this part of the country. And he agreed to that. Britain's ambivalence in fulfilling her obligations to create a national home for the Jewish people at the outset of the mandate resulted in the deaths of an untold number of Jewish people who could have escaped the Holocaust. As the mandate ended and the Union Jack was lowered over Haifa Harbor, it was flying upside down, a sign of distress. Was it mere coincidence?